This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. So people might not know this, but you were actually episode number one of this podcast just a couple of years ago, and now we're back. And it so happens that a lot of exciting things happened in both physics and artificial intelligence, both fields that you're super passionate about. Yeah, I'd love to, especially now as we start 2021 here. It's a really fun time to think about what were the biggest breakthroughs in AI, not the ones necessarily that media wrote about, but that really matter. And and what does that mean for our ability to do better science? What does it mean for our ability uh, to help people around the world? And what does it mean for new um, problems that they could cause if we're not smart enough to avoid them? So, you know, what do we learn basically from this? Yes, absolutely. So one of the amazing things you're part of is the AI Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. What's up with this institute? What what are you working on? What are you thinking about? The idea is something I'm very on fire with, which is basically AI meets physics. And, um, you know, it's been almost five years now since I shifted my own MIT research from physics to machine learning. And in the beginning, I noticed a lot of my colleagues, even though they were polite about it, were like, kind of, <laughs> what is Max doing? What is this weird stuff? <laughs> He's lost his mind. <laughs> then, But then gradually, I, uh, together with some colleagues, were able to persuade more and more of the other professors in the, our physics department to get interested in this. And, and, and um, now we got this amazing NSF center, so 20 million bucks for for the next five years, MIT and a bunch of neighboring universities here also. And I noticed now those colleagues who were looking at me funny have stopped asking <laughs> why I'm, what the point is of this because it's becoming more clear. And I really believe that, of course, AI can help physics a lot to do better physics, but physics can also help uh, AI a lot, both by building better hardware. My colleague Marin Soljacic, for example, is working on an optical chip for much faster machine learning where the computation is done not by moving electrons around, and, but by moving photons around. Dramatically less energy use, faster, better. Um, we, all can, we can also help AI a lot, I think, by having a uh, a different set of tools and a different, maybe more audacious attitude. You know, AI has, to a significant extent, been an engineering discipline where you're just trying to make things that work mm -hmm. and being less in more interested in maybe selling them than in figuring out exactly how they work and proving theorems about that they will always work, right? Yeah. Contrast that with physics. You know, when Elon Musk sends a rocket to the International Space Station, they didn't just train with machine learning, oh, let's fire it a little bit left, more to the left, a bit more to the right, oh, that also missed, let's try here. No, you know, we figured out Newton's laws of gravitation and other and got other things and got a really deep fundamental understanding. Uh, and that's what gives us such confidence in, in rockets. And my vision is that in the future, all machine learning systems that actually have impact on, on people's lives will be understood at a really, really deep level, right? So we trust them not because some sales rep told us to, but because they've earned our trust. We can, in really safety critical things, even prove that they will always do you know, what we expect them to do. That's very much the physics mindset. So it's interesting if, if you look at big breakthroughs that have happened in machine learning this year, you know, from dancing robots, you know, this 
pretty fantastic. I mean, not just because it's cool, but if you just think about not that many years ago, this YouTube video at this DARPA challenge where the MIT robot comes out of the car and face plants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How far we've come in, yes. in just a few years. Similarly, Alpha Fold 2, you know, crushing the protein folding problem. We can talk more about implications for medical yes. research and stuff, but hey, you know, that's huge progress. I, I, you, you can look at uh, GPT-3 that can spout off English text, which sometimes really, really blows you away. Yeah. Uh, you can look at the uh, Google at DeepMind's uh, Mu Zero, which doesn't just kick our butt in um, Go and chess and Shogi, but also in all these Atari games. And you don't even have to teach it the rules now. Mm -hmm. You know what all of those have in common is besides being powerful is we don't fully understand how they work and that's fine if it's just some dancing robots and the worst thing that can happen is they face plant right or if, if they're playing go and the worst thing that can happen is that they make a bad move and lose the game right it it's less fine if that's what's controlling your self-driving car or your nuclear power plant and uh, we've seen already that even though Hollywood had all these movies where they try to make us worry about the wrong things, like machines turning evil, the actual bad things that have happened with automation have not been machines turning evil. Mm -hmm. They've been caused by overtrust in things we didn't understand as well as we thought we did, right? Even yeah. very simple automated systems like what uh, Boeing put into the 737 MAX, right? Yes. Killed a lot of people. Was it that that little simple system was evil? Of course not. But we didn't understand it as well as we should have, right? And we trusted without understanding. Exactly. That's we, the overtrust. We didn't even understand that we didn't understand, right? <laughs> the humility is really at the core of being a scientist. I think step one, if you want to be a scientist, is don't ever fool yourself into thinking you understand things when you actually don't. Yes. Right? That's uh, probably good advice for humans in general. I think humility in general can do <laughs> us good. But in science, it's so spectacular. Like, why did we have the wrong theory of gravity ever from Aristotle yeah. onward and close to, until like Galileo's time? Like, why would we believe something so dumb as that if I throw this water bottle, it's going to go up with constant speed? <laughs> until it realizes that its natural motion is down. It changes its mind. You know, because we, people just kind of assumed Aristotle was right, he's an authority, we understand yeah. that. Uh, why did we believe things like that the sun is going around the earth? Why did we believe that time flows at the same rate for everyone until Einstein? Same exact mistake over and over again. We just weren't humble enough to acknowledge that we actually didn't know for sure. We assumed we knew, uh, so we didn't discover the truth because we assumed there was nothing there to be discovered, right? Mm -hmm. There was something to be discovered about the 737 MAX, and if you had been a bit more suspicious and tested it better, we would have found it. And it's the same thing with, with most harm that's been done by automation so far, I would say. So I don't know if you, did you hear of a company called Knight Capital? No. So good. That means you didn't invest in them earlier. <laughs> <laughs> they deployed this automated trading system. Yes. All nice and shiny. They didn't understand it as well as they thought. And it went about losing 10 million bucks per minute yeah. for 44 minutes straight. Oh, no. Until someone presumably was like, oh, no, shut this <laughs> off. You know, uh, it was it evil. No, it was again misplaced trust something they didn't fully understand right and um there have been so many um, even when people have been killed by robots it's just quite rare still uh, but in act factory accidents it's in every single case been not malice just that the robot didn't understand that hey a human is different from an auto part or whatever and and we, we um so this is where i think there's so so much opportunity for a physics approach where you just aim for a higher level of understanding and if you look at the all these systems that we talked about from the from 
reinforcement learning systems and dancing robots to all these neural networks that power GPT-3 and, and Go playing software and stuff. They're all basically black boxes, much like not so different from if you teach a human something, you have no idea how their brain works, right? Mm -hmm. Except the human brain at least has been error corrected <laughs> during many, many centuries of evolution in a way that these some of these systems have not, right? Yes. And um, my, my MIT research is entirely focused on demystifying this black box. Intelligible intelligence is my slogan. That's a good line, intelligible intelligence. Yeah, it's not that we shouldn't settle for something that seems intelligent, but we should. it should be intelligible so that we actually trust it because we understand it, right? Like, again, Elon trusts his rockets because he understands Newton's laws and the thrust and how everything works. Uh, and let me tell you what, can I tell you why I'm optimistic about this? Yes. I think, I think there is, we've made a bit of a mistake uh, where we, some people still think that somehow we're never going to understand neural networks. Uh, we're just going to have to learn to live with this. It's this very powerful black box. Basically, for those you know, who haven't spent time building their own, it, it's super simple what happens inside. You send in a long list of numbers, and then you do a bunch of operations on them, multiply by matrices, et cetera, et cetera, and some other numbers come out. That's the output of it. And then there are a bunch of knobs you can tune. And when you change them, you know, it affects the computation, mm -hmm. the input-output relation. And then you just give the computer some definition of good, and it mm -hmm. keeps optimizing these knobs until it performs as good as possible. And often you go like, wow, that's really good. Mm -hmm. This robot can dance, <laughs> or this machine is beating me at chess now. Um, and in the end, you have something which, even though you can look inside it, you have very little idea of how it works. You know, you can print out tables of all the millions of parameters in there. Is it crystal clear now how it's working? And you know, of course not, right? Yeah. So, so many of my colleagues seem willing to settle for that. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's like the halfway point. Uh, uh, some have even gone as far as sort of guessing that the mystery, the, the inscrutability of this is where the some of the power comes from and sort of some sort of mysticism. Uh, I think that's total nonsense. I, I think the real power of neural networks comes not from inscrutability, but from differentiability. And what I mean by that is simply that the output depends, changes only smoothly if you tweak your knobs, mm -hmm. and then you can use all these powerful methods we have for optimization in science, we can just tweak them a little bit and see, did that get better or worse? Mm -hmm. right, that's the fundamental idea of machine learning, that the machine itself can keep optimizing until it gets better. Suppose you wrote this an algorithm instead in Python or some other programming language, and then what what the knobs did was they just changed random letters in your, in your code. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we'll just epically fail, right? You yeah. change one thing, and instead of saying print, it says synth, yeah. uh, syntax error. You don't even know, was that this for the better or for the worse, right? This, to me, is re this is what I believe is the fundamental power of, of and, neural networks. And just to clarify, the changing of the different letters in a program would not be a differentiable process. It would make it an invalid program, yeah. typically, and then you wouldn't even know if, if you changed more letters, if it would make it work again, right? So that's the magic of uh, neural networks, uh, the inscrutability. The differentiability, <laughs> that, that every every yeah. setting of the parameters is a program, and you can yeah. tell is it better or worse, right? And so... So you don't like the poetry of the mystery of neural networks as the source of its power? I generally like poetry, <laughs> but... <laughs> Not in this case. It's, okay. mis it's so misleading. And it, it, above all, it, it short changes us. It fails. It, it makes us underestimate what we can, the good things we can accomplish. Because, So what we've been doing in my group is basically step one, train the mysterious neural network to do something well. Mm -hmm. And then step two, do some additional... AI techniques to see if we can now transform this black box into something equally intelligent that you can actually understand. So for example, I'll give you one example, this AI Feynman uh, project yes. that we just published, right? So we took 
the 100 most famous or complicated equations from one of my favorite physics textbooks. In fact, the one that got me into physics in the first place, mm -hmm. the Feynman lectures on physics. And uh, so you have a formula, you know, maybe it has what goes into the formula is six different variables, and then what comes out is one. So then you can make like a giant Excel spreadsheet with seven columns. <laughs> You put in just random numbers for the six columns for those six input variables, and then you, you calculate with a formula of the seventh column, mm -hmm. the output. So maybe it's like the force equals, in the last column, some function of the other. And now the task is, okay, if I don't tell you what the formula was, can you figure that out from looking at my spreadsheet I gave you? Yes. This problem is called symbolic regression. If I tell you that the formula is what we call a linear formula, so it's just that the output is... ...with length. So, but we, so we, but we had this idea that if you first have a neural network that can actually approximate the formula, you just trained it, even if you don't understand how it works, mm -hmm. that can be a first step towards actually understanding how it works. So, the, so that's what we do first. And then we study that neural network now and put in all sorts of other data that wasn't in the original training data and use that to discover simplifying properties of the formula. And that lets us break it apart often into many simpler pieces in a kind of divide and conquer approach. That we, so we were able to solve all of those hundred formulas, discover them automatically, mm -hmm. plus a whole bunch of other ones. And uh, it's a, uh, it's actually kind of humbling to see that this code, which anyone who wants now, he was looking at at how much radiation comes out from at different wavelengths from a hot object, and discovered the famous black body formula. This discovers it automatically. Uh, I'm I'm actually excited about seeing if we can discover not just old formulas again, but new formulas that no one has seen before. I do like this process of using kind of a neural network to find some basic insights and then dissecting the neural network to then gain the final. So that that's. In that way, you've uh, f forcing the explainability issue of, you know, re really trying to analyze a neural network uh, for the things it knows in order to come up with the final beautiful, simple theory underlying yeah. the whole, the, the, init the initial system that you were looking at. I, I love that. And, and the reason I'm so optimistic that it can be generalized to so much more is because that's exactly what we do as right. humans. One step further, when he got older, he went back and was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I can write down a formula for yeah. this. Y equals X squared, a parabola. You know, and he helped revolutionize physics as we know it, right? So there was a basic neural network in there from childhood that captured like the base, the experiences of observing tr different kinds of trajectories. And then he was able to go back in with another extra little neural network and analyze all those experiences and be like, wait a minute, there's a deeper rule here. Exactly, he was yeah. able to distill out in symbolic form what that complicated black box neural network was doing, right? Not only did he, the formula he get, <laughs> He got ultimately become more accurate, you know. And, and similarly, this is how he, how Newton got Newton's laws, which is why Elon can send rockets to the space mm -hmm. station now, right? So it's not only more accurate, but it's also simpler, much simpler. And it's so simple that we can actually describe it to our friends mm -hmm. and each other, right? Uh, we've talked about it just in the context of physics now, but hey, you know, isn't this what we're doing when we're talking to each other also? Mm -hmm. We go around with our neural networks, just like dogs and cats and chipmunks and blue jays, and we experience things in the world. But then we humans do this additional step on top of that, where we then distill out certain high-level knowledge that we've extracted from this 
in a way that we, and communicate it to each other in a symbolic form in English, in this case, right? So if we can do it, and we believe that we are information processing entities, then we should be able to make machine learning that does it also. Well, do you think the entire thing could be learning? Because there, um, this dissection process, like for AI Feynman, the secondary stage feels like something like reasoning. And the initial step feels like more like the the more basic kind of differentiable learning. Do you think the whole thing could be differentiable learning? Do you think the whole thing could be basically neural networks on top of each other? It's like turtles all the way down. Could it be neural networks all the way down? I mean, it's, that's a really interesting question. We know that in, in your case, it is neural networks all the way down because that's Allegedly. all you have in your skull as a bunch of neurons doing their thing, right? Yeah. But uh, if you ask the question more generally, what what algorithms are your brain is your brain are, are being used in your brain? Yeah. Right? I think it's super interesting to compare. I think we've gotten a little bit backwards historically because we humans first discovered good old fashioned AI, the logic based yeah. AI that we often call GoFi for good old fashioned AI. <laughs> as the old fashioned thing. But if you look at evolution on Earth, right, it's actually been the other way around. I would I would say that, <laughs> for example, a, an eagle has a better vision system than I have mm -hmm. using and dogs are just as good at casting tennis balls as, as I am. All this stuff, which is done by training a neural network, and not interpreting it in words, you know, is something so many of our animal friends can do, at least as well as us, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that we humans can do that the chipmunks and the eagles cannot? It's more to do with this logic-based stuff, right? Where we can extract out information in symbols. And there seems to be basically two strategies I see in industry now. One scares the heebie-jeebies, out of me and the other one i find much more encouraging okay which one uh, can, can we break them apart which which of the two <laughs> the one that scares the heebie-jeebies out of me is this attitude that we're just going to make ever bigger systems that we still don't understand uh -huh. until they can do be as smart as humans i what could possibly go wrong <laughs> right yeah I, I think it's just such a reckless thing to do and, and unfortunately and if we actually succeed as a species to build artificial general intelligence, then we still have no clue how it works. I think at least 50% chance we're going to be extinct before too long. It's just going to be an utter epic uh, own goal. You know? So it's that 44 minutes losing money problem or like the paperclip problem, like where we don't understand how it works and it's just in a matter of seconds runs away in some kind of direction that's going to be very problematic even long before you have to worry about the machines themselves uh somehow deciding to do things and to us that we have to worry about people using machines that are short of ai agi and power to do bad things i mean just t take a moment and if if anyone who's not worried particularly about advanced AI, just take 10 seconds and just think about your least favorite leader on the planet right now. Don't tell me who it is. Mm -hmm. I want to keep this apolitical. But just see the face in front of you, that person, for 10 seconds. Yes. Now imagine that that person has this incredibly powerful AI under their control and can use it to impose their will on the whole planet. How does that make you feel? Yeah, so the, the, the can can we break that apart just briefly for the fifty percent chance that we'll run to trouble with this approach? Do you see the bigger worry in that leader or humans using the system to do damage, or are you more worried? And I think I'm in this camp more worried about like accidental, unintentional destruction of everything so sort of like humans trying to do good and like in a way where everyone agrees it's kind of good 
It's just that they're trying to do good without understanding. Because I think every evil yeah. leader in history thought they're, to some degree, thought they're trying to do good. Oh yeah, I'm sure Hitler thought he was doing, he was doing good. Yeah, he was Stal to do good too. I, I've been reading a lot about Stalin. I'm sure Stalin is from. He legitimately thought that communism was good for the world, and that he was doing good. I think and, Mao Zedong thought what he was yeah. doing with a great leap forward was good too. Yeah, uh, I th I'm actually concerned about both of those. Uh, before I promise to answer this uh, in detail, but before we do that, I, I, let me finish answering the first question because I told you that there were two different yes. routes we could get to artificial general intelligence, and one scares the yes. TVs out of me, uh, which is this one where we build something, we just say bigger neural networks, ever more hardware, and yes. just train the heck out of more data, and poof, now it's very powerful. Uh, that I think. Uh, <laughs> Because I think it's cool for science, but because I think the more we understand I mean, these systems, the better the chances that we can make them do the things that are good for us that are actually intended, not unintended. So, so you think it's possible to prove things about something as complicated as a neural network? That's the hope? Well, ideally, I mean, there's no reason it has to be a neural network in the end either, right? Like right. we discovered Newton's laws of gravity with n neural network in Newton's head. Yes. But that's not the way it's programmed into the navigation system of Elon Musk's rocket anymore. Right. It's written in C++ or I don't know what language he uses exactly. Yeah. And then there are software tools called symbolic verification. DARPA and the US uh, and military has done a lot of really great research on this because they really want to understand that when they build weapon systems, they don't just go fire at random or malfunction, right? And um, there's even a whole operating system called Cell 3 that's been developed by a DARPA grant where you can actually mathematically prove that this thing can never be hacked. Uh, wow. It, I w one day, I hope that will be something you can say about the OS that's running on our laptops too. As you know, <laughs> we're not there, but I think we should be ambitious, frankly. Yeah. And and if we can use machine learning to help do the proofs and so on as well, right? Then it, it's much easier to verify that a proof is correct than to come up with a proof in the first place. That's really the core idea here. If someone I, I, comes on your on your podcast and says they they proved the Riemann hypothesis or some new sensational new theorem, mm -hmm. it's not me. It's much easier for some one else take some smart grad math grad students to check. Oh, there's an error here on equa mm -hmm. in equation five, or this really checks out. Than it was to discover the proof. Yeah, although some of those proofs are pretty complicated, but yes, it's still nevertheless much easier to uh, to verify the proof. I love the optimism. You know, we kind of, even with the security of systems, there's a kind of cynicism that pervades people who think about this, which is like, well, it's hopeless. I mean, in the same sense, exactly like you're saying when you don't know works, oh, it's hopeless yeah. to understand what's happening. Uh, with security, people are just like, well, it's always going. There's always going to be um, attack vectors yeah. and like uh, ways ways to attack the system. But you're right. We're just very new with these computational systems. We're new with these intelligent systems, and and it's not out of the realm of possibility. Just like people that understand the movement of the stars and the planets and so on. Yeah, it's it's entirely possible that like within hopefully soon but it could be within a hundred years yeah. we start to have an obvious like laws of gravity about intelligence yeah. and uh, uh god forbid about consciousness too that that one is <laughs> agreed you know i think um of course if you're selling computers that get hacked a lot that's in your interest as a company that people think it's impossible to make it safe so you know nobody's going to get the idea of suing you but i want to really inject optimism here it the, there it, it's it's absolutely possible yeah. to do to much better than we're doing now and you know if your laptop does so much stuff you don't need the music player to be super safe in your in your future t self driving car right um, if someone hacks it and starts playing music you don't like 
the world won't end. But what you can do is you can break out and say that the drive computer that controls your safety must be completely physically decoupled entirely from the entertainment system. And it must physically be such that it can't take on over the air updates while you're driving. And it can be, it can have, it's not that it can have ultimately a sort some operating system on it, which is symbolically verified and proven uh, that, that it's always going to do what it's going to, what it's supposed to do. Right. And we can basically have, and companies should take that attitude. They should look at everything they do and say, what are the few systems in our, in our company that threaten the whole life of the company if they get hacked, you know, and have the highest standards for them. And then they can save money by going for, for the El Cheapo, poorly understood stuff for the rest, you know. This, this is very feasible, I think. And coming back to the bigger question about, that you, you worried about, that, that there will be unintentional failures, I think there are two quite separate risks here, right? We talked a lot about one of them, which is that the goals are noble of the human. Mm -hmm. The human says, I want this airplane to not crash because this is not Muhammad Atta now flying the airplane, right? Mm -hmm. And now there's this technical challenge of making sure that the, the autopilot is actually going to behave as, as the pilot wants. Um, if you set that aside, there's also the separate question. How do you make sure that the goals of the pilot are actually aligned with the goals of the passenger? How do you make sure very much more broadly that if we can all agree as a species that we would like things to kind of go well for humanity as a whole, that the goals are aligned here, mm -hmm. the alignment problem. And um, here there's been a lot of progress in, in the sense that there's suddenly huge amounts of research going on on it, about it. I'm, I'm very grateful to Elon Musk for giving us that money five years ago so we could launch the first research program on technical AI safety and alignment. There's a lot of stuff happening. But I think we need to do more than just make sure little machines do always what their owners do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that wouldn't have prevented September 11. If Mohammed Atta said, okay, okay, autopilot, please fly into World Trade Center, you know, and it's like, okay, <laughs> That even happened in a different situation. There was this depressed pilot named Andreas Lubitz, right, who told his German Wings passenger jet to fly into the Alps. He just told the computer to change the altitude to 100 meters or something like that. And you know what the computer said? What? Okay. Okay. And it had the frigging topographical map of the Alps in there. It had GPS, everything. No one had bothered teaching it even the basic kindergarten ethics of, of like, no, uh, we never want airplanes to fly into mountains under any circumstances. Uh, and so we have to think beyond just uh, the technical issues and think about how do we align in general incentives on this planet for the greater good. So starting with simple stuff like that, every airplane that has a computer in it should be taught whatever kindergarten ethics it's smart enough to understand. Like, no, don't fly into fixed objects. If the pilot tells you to do so, then go on autopilot mode, send an email to the cops and land at the latest airport, nearest airport. You know, any car with a forward facing camera should just be programmed by the vet, by the manufacturer so that it will never accelerate into a human ever. Mm -hmm. That would av avoid things like the Nice attack and many horrible terrorist vehicle attacks where they deliberately did that, right? This was not some sort of thing, oh, you know, US and China, different views on no, there was not a single car manufacturer on the world in the world, right, who wanted the cars to do this. They just hadn't thought to do the alignment. And if if you look at more broadly problems that happen on this planet, the vast majority have to do with poor alignment. I mean Think about let's go back really big because I know this is you're so good <laughs> let's at go that. Big, yeah. yeah, in the very so long ago in evolution, we had these genes, yeah. and you they wanted to make copies of themselves. That's really all they cared about. So they some genes said, "Hey, I'm gonna build a brain on this body I'm in, so that I, yeah. I can get better at making copies of myself." Yes, and then they decided for their benefit 
to get copied more, to align your brain's incentives with their incentives. So it didn't want you to starve to death. So it gave you an incentive to eat. Yes. And it it wanted you to make copies of, of the genes. So it gave you an incentive to fall in love and do all sorts of naughty things <laughs> to, to, to make copies of, it, of, of itself, right? Yeah. Uh, so that was successful value alignment done on the genes. <laughs> they created something more intelligent than themselves, but they made sure to try to align the values. Mm -hmm. But then something went a little bit wrong against the idea of what the genes wanted because a lot of humans discovered, hey, you know, yeah, we really like this business about sex uh, that the genes have made us enjoy, but we don't want to have babies right now. Yeah. So we're going to hack the genes yeah. and use birth control. Yeah. And I really feel like drinking a Coca-Cola right now, but I don't want to get a pot belly, so I'm going to drink Diet Coke. You know, yeah. we, we have all these things we've figured out because we're smarter than the genes, how we can actually subvert their intentions. So, so it's not surprising that this, we humans now, when we're in the role of these genes, creating other non-human entities with a lot of power, have to face the same exact challenge. How do we make... institutions that are supposed to govern you? Because yeah. you ultimately, as a corporation, have an incentive to maximize your profit. It's like you have an incentive to maximize the enjoyment your brain has, not for your genes. So if they can figure out a way of of bribing regulators, then they're going to do that. Uh, in the U.S., we kind of caught on to that and made laws against corruption and bribery. Uh, then uh, in the late 1800s, uh, Teddy Roosevelt realized that no, we were still being kind of hacked because the Massachusetts railroad companies had like a bigger budget than the state of Massachusetts, and they were doing a lot of very corrupt stuff. And so he did the whole trust busting thing to try to align these other non-human entities, the companies, again, more with the incentives of Americans as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, it's not surprising, though, that you know this is a battle you have to keep fighting now. We have even larger companies than we ever had before. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're going to try to, uh, again, subvert uh, the institutions. Not because, you know, I think people make a mistake of getting all too um, black, thinking about things in terms of good and evil, like arguing about whether corporations are good or evil or whether robots are good or evil. A robot isn't good or evil, it's a tool. And you can use it for great things like robotic surgery or for bad things. And a corporation also is a tool, of course. And if you have good incentives to the corporation, it'll do great things like start a hospital or a grocery store. If you have really bad incentives, then it's gonna start maybe marketing addictive drugs to people and you'll have an opioid epidemic, right? Uh, it's all about I don't want we should we not make the mistake of getting into some sort of fairy tale good evil thing about corporations or robots. We should focus on putting the right incentives in place. My optimistic vision is that if we can do that, you know, then we can really get good things. We're not doing so great with that right now, either on AI, I think, or on other intelligent non human entities like big companies, right? We just have a new um Secretary of, of Defense who's going to start up now in, in the Biden administration, who is was an active member of the board of Raytheon, for oh, example. Well, yeah. So, you know, I have nothing against Raytheon. Uh, I'm, all, I'm not a pacifist, but there's an obvious conflict of interest if someone is in the job where they decide who they're going to contract with. And I think somehow... We have, uh, maybe we need another Teddy Roosevelt to come along again and say, hey, you know, we want what's good for all Americans. And we need to go do some serious realigning again of the incentives that we're giving to these big companies. And um, then we're going to be better off. It seems that naturally with human beings, just like you beautifully described the history of this whole thing, 
uh, of it all started with the genes, and they're they're probably pretty upset by the, <laughs> all the unintended consequences that happened since. But the it seems that it kind of works out. Like it's in this collective intelligence that emerges at the different levels. It seems to find sometimes <laughs> each other and their incentives of different cities in the kingdom became more aligned, right? That's that was the whole selling point. Harari. Yeah. Noah Yuval Harari has a beautiful piece on how empires were collaboration enablers. And then we also Harari says invented money for that reason. So we could have better alignment and we could do trade even with people we didn't know. Yeah. So this sort of stuff has been playing out since time immemorial, right? What's changed is that it happens on ever larger scales, right? The technology keeps getting better because science gets better. So now we can communicate over larger distances, transport things fast over larger distances. And the, so the, the entities get ever bigger, but our planet is not getting bigger anymore. So in the past, you could have one experiment that just totally screwed up, like Easter Island, where they actually managed to have such poor alignment that when they went extinct, people there, there was no one else to come back and replace them, yes. right? If Elon Musk doesn't get us to Mars and then we go extinct on a global scale, then we're not coming back. That, that's the fundamental. Mm -hmm. planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and then okay, the, now there's this nice uninhabited land here. Some other people could move in and organize things better. This is different. The, the second thing, which is also different, is um, that technology gives us so much more empowerment, right? Both to do good things and also to screw up. In the Stone Age, even if you had someone whose goals were really poorly aligned, like maybe he was really pissed up off because his Stone Age girlfriend dumped him and he just wanted to... It's a billion people, or we don't know. Uh, so, the, so the scale of the damage is bigger that we can do. And, and if... if um, it's it, There's obviously no law of physics that says that technology will never get powerful enough that we could wipe out our species entirely. That would just be f fantasy to think that science is somehow doomed to not get more powerful than that, right? And and it's not at all unfeasible in our lifetime that someone could design a designer pandemic which spreads as easily as COVID, but just basically kills everybody. We already had smallpox. It killed one third of everybody who got it. And, and um, what do you think of the, the, here's an intuition, maybe it's completely naive and uh, this optimistic intuition I have, which it seems, and maybe it's a biased experience that I have, but it seems like the most brilliant people I've met in my life all are really like fundamentally good human beings and not like naive good, like they really want to do good for the world in a way that well, maybe is aligned to my sense of what good means. And so I have a sense that the uh, the people that will be defining the very cutting edge of technology, there will be much more of the ones that are doing good versus the ones that are doing evil. So the race, I'm optimistic on the us always like last minute coming up with a solution. So if, if there's an engineered pan pandemic, that has the cap uh, capability to destroy most of the human civilization. It, it feels like to me, either leading up to that before or as it's going on, there will be, uh, we're able to rally the, the collective genius of the human species. I could tell by your smile that you're uh, <laughs> at least some percentage uh, um, doubtful but is that could that be a fundamental law of human nature that evolution only create it creates uh war, like karma is beneficial good is beneficial and therefore we'll be all right build the solutions that your skill set allows to yeah build. which is a lot i think we underestimate often very much how much good we can do right if the if you or anyone listening to this uh is completely confident 
that our government would do a perfect job on handling any future crisis with <laughs> engineered pandemics or future AI. I the, actually the to one reflect or two a bit on, out there. On, on, on what actually happened in 2020. <laughs> do you feel that the government by and large around the world has handled this flawlessly? Uh, that's a really sad and disappointing reality that uh, hopefully is a wake up call for everybody. Uh, for the scientists, for the for the re, for the engineers, for the researchers in AI, especially, it was disappointing to see how uh, inefficient we were at sp spread uh, at collecting the right amount of data in a privacy preserving way, and spreading that data and utilizing that data to make decisions, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, I think when something bad happens to me, I made myself. Uh, I promised many years ago that I would not be a whiner. <laughs> uh, so yes. when something bad happens to me, of course it's uh, just a process, the disappointment. But then I, I try to focus on what did I learn from this that can make me a better person in the future. And there's usually something to be learned when I fail. And I think we should all ask ourselves, what can we learn from the pandemic? about how we can do better in the future. And you mentioned there a really good lesson. You know, we were not as resilient as we thought we were. And we were not as prepared, maybe, as we wish we were. You can even see very stark contrasts around the planet. South Korea, right, they have over 50 million people. Do you know how many deaths they have from COVID last time I checked? No. It's about 500. <laughs> You know, why is that? Well, the short answer is that they had prepared. They were incredibly quick, incredibly quick to get on it with very rapid testing and contact tracing and so on, which is why they never had more cases than they could contract trace effectively, right? Mm -hmm. They never even had to have the kind of big lockdowns we had in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, but the deeper answer to it, it's not just the Koreans are just somehow better people. The reason I think they were better prepared was because they had already had a pretty bad hit from the SARS pandemic, mm -hmm. or which never became a pandemic, uh, something like 17 years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a fresh memory that, you know, we need to be prepared for pandemics. So they were, right? And so maybe this is a lesson here for all of us to draw from COVID that rather than just wait for the next pandemic or the next problem with AI getting out of control or anything else, maybe we should just actually set aside a tiny fraction of, of our GDP to have people very systematically do some horizon scanning and say, okay, what are the things that could go wrong? And let's duke it out and see which are the more likely ones and which are the ones that are actually actionable and then be prepared. Uh, so one of the observations as one little ant slash human that I am of disappointment is the political division over information that has been observed, that I observed this year, that it seemed uh, the discussion was less about uh, sort of... Uh, what happened and understanding what happened deeply and more about there's different truths out there and it's like a argument my truth is better than your truth and it's it's like red versus blue or different like it, it was like this ridiculous discourse that doesn't seem to get at any kind of notion of the truth it's not like a, some kind of scientific process even science got politicized in yeah. ways that's very yeah. heartbreaking to me uh you have an exciting project on the ai front uh of trying to rethink one of the you mentioned corporations there's one of the other collective intelligence systems that have emerged through all of this is social networks and just the spread of the internet is is the spread of information on the uh, the internet? Our ability to share that information. There's all different kinds of news sources and so on. And so you said, like, that's from first principles. Let's rethink how we 
think about the news, how we think about information. Can you talk about this uh, amazing effort that you're undertaking? Oh, I'd love to. This has been my big COVID project. <laughs> it's been nights and weekends on ever since the lockdown. To segue into this, actually, let me come back to what you said earlier, that you had this hope that in your experience, people who were, you felt were very talented or often idealistic and wanted to do good. Frankly, I, I feel the same about all people, by and large. There are always exceptions, but I think the vast majority of everybody, regardless of education and whatnot, really are fundamentally good, right? So how can it be that people still do so much nasty stuff? Right, mm -hmm. I think it has everything to do with this, with the information that we're given. Yes, you know, if you go into Sweden five hundred years ago and you start telling all the farmers that those Danes in Denmark they're so terrible people, you know, and we have to invade them, yes, because they've done all these terrible things that you can't fact check yourself. Eh, a lot of people, Swedes did that, right? And it and um. We've seen we're seeing so much of this today in the world, both geopolitically, you know, where we are told that that China is bad and Russia is bad and Venezuela is bad, and people in those countries are often told that we are bad, and we also see it at a micro level, you know, where people are told that oh, those who voted for the other party are bad people. It's not just an intellectual disagreement, but they're bad people and um we're getting ever more divided and so how do you reconcile this with with this intrinsic goodness i in people i i, I think it's pretty obvious that it has again to do with this with the information that we're fed and given right we evolved to live in small groups where you might know 30 people in total right so you then had a system that was quite good for assessing who you could trust and who you could not. And if someone told you that, you know, Joe there is a jerk, but you had interacted with him yourself and seen him in action, and, and you would pre quickly realize maybe that that's actually not quite accurate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but now that we, the most people on the planet are people we've never met, it's very important that we have a way of trusting the information we're given. And so, okay, so where does the news project come in? Well, Throughout history, you can go read Machiavelli, you know, from the 1400s, and you'll see how already then they were busy manipulating people with propaganda and stuff. Propaganda is not new at all. <laughs> and the incentives to manipulate people is just not new at all. What is it that's new? What's new is machine learning meets propaganda. That's what's new. That's why this has gotten so much worse. You know, some people like to blame certain individuals, like in my liberal university bubble, many people blame Donald Trump and say it was his fault. Our friends who work for these companies, the good people, they deployed machine learning algorithms just to increase their profit a little bit to just maximize the time people spent watching ads. And they had totally underestimated how effective they were going to be. This was, again, the black box, non-intelligible intelligence. Mm -hmm. They just noticed, oh, we're getting more ad revenue. Great. It took a long time until they even realized why and how and how damaging this was for society. Because, of course, what the machine learning figured out was that the by far most effective way of gluing you to your little rectangle was to show you things that triggered strong emotions, mm -hmm. anger, et cetera, resentment. And uh, if it was true or not, it didn't really matter. It was also easier to find stories that weren't true. If you weren't limited, that's just a limitation right. that's, to show people. That's a, that's a very limiting fact. And yes. before long, we got these amazing filter bubbles on a scale we had never seen before. Yeah. I coupled this to the fact that also the online news media were so effective that they killed a lot of print journalism. There's on, there's on less than half as many journalists now in America, I believe, as there was you know, a generation ago. You just couldn't compete with the online. Even reading newspapers, they get, get their news from social media. And 
most people only get news <laughs> in their little bubble. So along comes now some people like Donald Trump who, who figured out among the first successful politicians to figure out how to really play this new game and become very, very influential. But I think that was, Donald Trump was a simp. Well, he, he, he took advantage of it. He didn't create the, the fundamental conditions were created by machine learning sort of taking over the news media. So this is what motivated my little COVID project here. So, you know, I said before, machine learning and tech in general is not evil, but it's also not good. It's just a tool mm -hmm. that you can use for good things or bad things. And as it happens, machine learning and news was mainly used by the big players, big tech to manipulate people into watch as many ads as possible, which had this unintended consequence of really screwing up our democracy into and fragmenting it into filter bubbles. So I thought, well, machine learning algorithms are basically free. They can run on your smartphone for free also if someone gives them away to you, right? There's no reason why they only have to help the big guy mm -hmm. to manipulate the little guy. They can just as well help the little guy to mm -hmm. see through all the manipulation attempts from the big guy. So did this project, it's called, you can go to improvethenews.org. The first thing we've built is the little, it's a little news aggregator. Looks a bit like Google News, except it has these sliders on it to help you break out of your filter bubble. So if you're, you're reading, you can click, click and go to your favorite topic. And then uh, if you just slide the left, right slider away, all the way over to the left, there's two sliders, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's the one, the ob most obvious one is the one that has left, right labeled on us. Yes. You go to the left, you get one set of articles, you go to the right, you see a very different truth yeah. appearing. Oh, that's literally left and right on the political a, spectrum. On the political yeah, spectrum. Yeah, so if you're reading about immigration, for example, it it's very, very noticeable. And, and I think step one, always, if you want to not get manipulated, is just to be able to recognize the techniques people use. So it's very helpful to just see how they spin things on the two mm -hmm. sides. Uh, I think uh, many people are under the misconception that the main problem is fake news. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, we I had an amazing team of MIT students where we did an academic project to use machine learning to detect the main kinds of bias over the summer. and. Yes, of course, sometimes there's fake news where someone just claims something that's false, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, Hillary Clinton just got divorced or something. Yes. But what we see much more of is actually just omissions. If you go to, uh, there's some stories which just won't be mentioned by the left or the right because mm -hmm. it doesn't suit their agenda. And then they'll instead mention other ones very, very, very much. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we've we've had a lot, a number of stories about the Trump family's financial dealings, mm -hmm. and then there's been a, some a bunch of stories about the Biden family's Hunter Biden's financial dealings. Right? Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise! They don't get equal coverage on the left and the right. Right. <laughs> one side yeah. loves to cover the Biden Hunter Biden stuff, and one side loves to cover the Trump. You can yeah. never guess which is which, right? <laughs> These, yeah. But the great news is if you want to, if you're a normal American citizen and you dislike corruption in all its forms, then slide, slide, you can just get look at both of the yeah. sides and you, you'll see all the corruption, those political corruption stories. It's really liberating to just take in the both sides, the spin on both sides. It somehow unlocks your mind to like think on your own. To realize that that I don't know, it's it's the same thing that was useful, right, in the Soviet Union times for when when everybody was much more aware that they're surrounded by propaganda. Right? That it's so interesting what you're saying, actually. Uh, so Noam Chomsky, uh, you know, used to be our MIT colleague, once said that propaganda is to democracy what violence is to totalitarianism and, and and what he means by that is if you have a really totalitarian government you don't need propaganda right people will do what you do, <laughs> what you want them to do anyway but out of fear right yes but otherwise 
you need propaganda. So I, I would say actually that the propaganda is much higher quality in democracies, much more believable. And it's That's really brilliant. <laughs> it, it's really striking. When I talk to colleagues, yeah. science colleagues like from Russia and China and so on. Uh, you taking the information. Yeah. And I, I think I have to say sometimes I feel that some of us in the academic bubble are, are too arrogant about this and somehow think Oh, it's just people who aren't as, oh, as educated as us <laughs> yeah, who are cool. Yeah. When we are often just as gullible also, you know, yes. we read only our media and and don't see through things. Anyone who looks at both sides like this and compares a little, will immediately start noticing the shenanigans being pulled. In. And, you know, I think what, what I try to do with, with this app is that the big tech has to some extent uh, try to blame the individual for being manipulated, much like big tobacco tried to blame the individuals entirely for smoking. Mm -hmm. And and a little later on, you know, our government stepped up and said, actually, you know, you can't just blame little kids for starting to smoke. We have to have more responsible advertising and this and that. I think it's a bit the same here. It's very convenient for a big tech to blame. So it's just people who are so dumb and get fooled. Yeah. Uh, the blame usually comes in saying, oh, it's just human psychology. People just want to hear what they already believe. But Professor David Rand at MIT actually partly debunked that with a really nice study showing that people are, tend to be interested in hearing things that go against what they believe if it's presented in a respectful way. Like, suppose, yeah. for example, that um, you have a company and you're just about to launch this project and you're convinced it's going to work. And someone says, you know, Lex, I hate to tell you this, but this is going to fail. And here's why. Would you be like, shut up, I don't want to hear it. La, 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 <laughs> yeah. Would yeah. you? You would be interested, right? Yes. And also, if you're on an airplane, uh, back in the pre-COVID times, you know, <laughs> and the guy next to you is clearly from the opposite side of the political spectrum, but it's very respectful and polite to you. Wouldn't you be kind of interested to hear a bit about how he or she thinks about things? Of course. Right? But it's not so easy to find out respectful disagreement now. Because, like, for example, if you are a Democrat and you're like, oh, I want to see something on the other side. So you just go Breitbart.com. Mm -hmm. And then after the first 10 seconds, you feel deeply insulted by something and they it's it's not going to work. Or if you take someone who votes Republican and they go to something on the left and they just get very offended very quickly by them having put a deliberately ugly picture of Donald Trump on the front page or something, it doesn't really work. So this news aggregator also has this nuance slider, mm -hmm. which you can pull to the right and then to make it easier to get exposed to actually more sort of academic style or more respectful um, mm -hmm. That's brilliant. Portrayals of, of different views. And and finally, the, the one kind of bias I think people are mostly aware of is the left-right, right? Mm -hmm. because it's so obvious, because both left and right are very powerful here, right? Both of them have well-funded TV stations and newspapers, and it's kind of hard to miss. But there's another one, the establishment slider, which is is also really fun. I, I, yeah. I, I love to play I with it. That and one. that's more about corruption. Yes, because if you have um, a society that where almost all the powerful entities want you to believe a certain thing, that's what you're going to read in both the big media, mainstream media on the left and on the right, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, powerful companies can push back very hard, like tobacco companies pushed back very hard back in the day when people, some newspapers started writing articles about tobacco being dangerous so that it was hard to get a lot of coverage about it initially and also if you look geopolitically right of course in any country when you read their media you're mainly going to be reading a lot of our articles about how our country is the good guy mm -hmm. and the other countries are the bad guys mm -hmm. right so if, if you want to have a really more nuanced understanding you know like the Germans used to be told that the, the 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 British used to be told that the French were the bad guys, and the French used to be told that the British were the bad guys. Now they 
visit each other's countries a lot and have a much more nuanced understanding. I don't think there's going to be any more wars between France and Germany. But on the geopolitical scale, it's just just as much as ever, you know, a big Cold War now, US China, and so on. And if you want to if you want to get a more nuanced understanding of what's happening geopolitically, then it's really fun to look at this establishment slider because there are, it turns out there are tons of little newspapers, both on the left and on the right, who sometimes challenge um, establishment and say, you know, maybe we shouldn't actually invade Iraq right now. Maybe this weapons of mass destruction thing is BS. If you look at the journalism research afterwards, you can actually see that quite clearly. That both CNN and Fox were very pro Let's get rid of Saddam. There are weapons of mass destruction. Of course, they were so hard to find. Most people yeah. didn't even know they existed, right? Yet it would have been better for American national security if those voices had also come up. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it harmed America's national security, actually, and, that we invaded Iraq. And arguably, there's That's a lot more interest in that kind of thinking too from those small sources so like the when you say big it's more about kind of uh the reach of the broadcast uh, mm -hmm. but it's not big in terms of the interest i yeah. think i think there's a lot of interest in that kind of anti-establishment or like skepticism towards you know out, out of the box thinking yeah. there's yeah. a lot of interest in that kind of thing do you see this a uh, news project or something like it being um, basically taken over the world as as the main way we consume information. Like, what's how do we get how do we get there? Like, how how do we you know? So okay, the idea is brilliant. It's a it's a you call you're calling it your little project <laughs> in 2020. But how does that become the new way we consume information? I hope, first of all, just to plant a little seed there, because normally the big barrier of doing anything in media is you, you need a ton of money, but this costs no money at all. Classify the articles and stuff, so it just kind of runs by itself. So if it actually gets good enough at some point that it starts catching on, it could scale. And if other people carbon copy it and make other versions that are better, that's more, the more the merrier. I think there's a real opportunity for machine learning to empower the individual against uh, the, style, the powerful players. Uh, it's As I said in the beginning here, it's been mostly the other way around so far, that the big right. players have the AI and then they tell people this is the truth, this is how it is. But it can just as well go the other way around. And when the internet was born, actually, a lot of people had this hope that maybe this will be a great thing for democracy, make it easier to find out about things. And maybe machine learning and things like this can uh, can actually help again. And I have to say, I think it's as imp it's more important than ever now, right? Because this is very linked also to the whole future of life, as we discussed earlier, right? We're getting this ever more powerful tech, you know, it's frank it's pretty clear if you look on the one or two generation three generation time scale that there are only two ways this can end Jupiter. love that right uh, but the, one of the biggest growth areas in robotics now is of course autonomous weapons right and and 2020 was like the best marketing uh, year ever for autonomous weapons because in both libya it's a civil war and in Nagorno-Karabakh, they made the decisive difference, right? And everybody else is like watching this. Oh, yeah, we want to build autonomous weapons too. In, in Libya, you had on one hand our ally, the United Arab Emirates, that were flying their autonomous weapons that they bought from China, bombing Libyans. And on the other side, you had our other ally, Turkey, flying their drones and um, they had no skin in the game any of these other countries and of course it was the libyans who really got screwed in nagorno karabakh you had actually again so now turkey is sending drones built by this company that was actually 
founded by a guy who went to MIT Aero Astro. Do you know that? No. Dr. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So MIT has a direct responsibility for ultimately this. And a lot of civilians were killed there, you know. And so because it was militarily so effective, now now suddenly there's like a huge push. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go build ever more autonomy into these these weapons and it's going to be great and uh i think actually people who are obsessed about some sort of future terminator scenario right now or should start focusing on the fact that we have two much more urgent threats happening from machine learning one of them is the whole destruction of democracy that we've talked about now yes. where 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 our flow of information is being manipulated by machine learning and the other one is that right now you know this is the year when the big arms race in out of control arms race in at least thomas weapons is going to start or it's going to stop so you have a sense that there is uh like 2020 was a instrumental catalyst for the race of for the autonomous weapons race yeah because it was the first year when when they proved decisive in the battlefield Oh, and and uh, these ones are still not fully autonomous. Mostly they're remote controlled, right? But you know, we could very quickly make things about you know the size and cost of a smartphone, which you just put in the GPS coordinates or the face of the one you want to kill, or skin color or whatever, and it flies away and you know does it. And the the real good reason why the U.S. and all the other superpowers should put the kibosh on this is the same reason we decided to put the kibosh on bioweapons. So, you know, we gave the Future of Life Award that we can talk more about later yes. to Matthew Messelson from Harvard before for convincing Nixon to ban bioweapons. And I asked him, how did you do it? <laughs> and he was like, well, <laughs> I just said, look, we don't want there to be a $500 weapon of mass destruction yeah. that even all our enemies can afford even non-state actors and nixon was like <laughs> good point <laughs> uh, you know it's in america's interest that the power of weapons are all really expensive so only uh, we uh, can afford them or maybe some more stable adversaries right uh, nuclear weapons are like that but bioweapons were not like that that's why we banned them and that's why you never hear about them now. That's why we love biology. So you have a sense that it's possible oh, yeah. for for the big powerhouses in terms of the the big nations in the world to agree that autonomous weapons is not a race we want to be on. That it doesn't end well. Yeah, because we we know it's just going to end in mass proliferation, and every terrorist everywhere is going to have these super cheap weapons that they will use against us. And it, and our and our politicians have to constantly worry about being assassinated every time they go outdoors by some anonymous little mini drone. You know, we don't want that. And if even if the U.S. and China and everyone else could just agree that you can only build these weapons if they cost at least ten million bucks, mm -hmm. that would that would be a huge win for the superpowers, and frankly for everybody. Um, the um, you don't, and people often push back and say, well, it's so hard to prevent cheating. Mm -hmm. But hey, you can say the same about bioweapons. You know, take any of your our MIT colleagues in biology. Of course, they could build some nasty bioweapon if they really wanted to. But first of all, they don't want to because they think it's disgusting because of the stigma. And second, even if there's some sort of nutcase and want to, it's very likely that some of their grad students or someone would rat them out because everyone yes. else thinks it's so disgusting, yes. right? Yeah. And in fact, we now know there was even a fair bit of cheating on the bioweapons ban, mm. but none, no countries used them because it was so stigmatized that it just wasn't worth revealing that they had cheated. You, you talk about drones, but you kind of think that drones is like remote operation. Which they are mostly still. Yes, but you're not. Is that you're removing yourself from the direct violence. Therefore, you're not able to sort of maintain the common humanity required to make the proper decisions strategically. But that's the criticism as opposed to like 
if this is automated, and just exactly as you said, if you automate it and there's a race, then it's going to the technology is going to get better and better and better, which means getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. And unlike perhaps nuclear weapons, which is connected to uh, resources in a way, like it's yeah. hard to get the, uh, it's hard to engineer. Yeah. Plutonium. It feels like it's, you know, um, there's too much overlap between the tech industry and autonomous weapons to where you could have smartphone type of uh cheapness mm -hmm. if you look at drones uh you know it's a it's a you know for a thousand dollars you can have an incredible system that's able to maintain flight autonomously for you and take pictures and stuff you, you could see that going into the autonomous weapon space that's um but like why is that not thought about or discussed enough in the public do you think you see those dancing boston dynamics robots and everybody has this kind of um... showing up at your house with guns, telling you to uh, who will be perfectly obedient to whatever dictator controls them. Yes. But, but, but let's leave that aside for a moment and look at what's actually relevant now. So there, there's a spectrum of things you can do with AI in the military. And again, to put my card on the table, I'm not the pacifist. I think we should have good defense. Um, so, for example, a Predator drone is a, basically a fancy little remote-controlled airplane, right? There's a human con in piloting it, and the decision ultimately about whether to kill somebody with it is made by a human still. <laughs> and th this is a line I think we should never cross. There's a current DOD policy. Again, you have to have a human in the loop. I think algorithms should never make life or death decisions. They should be left to humans. Um, now, why might we cross that line? Well, first of all, these are expensive, right? So, for example, when when uh, when, uh, when Azerbaijan had all these drones and Armenia didn't have any, they started trying to jerry-rig little cheap things, fly around, and, but then, of course, the Armenians would jam them, mm -hmm. or the Azeris would jam them. and. Remote control things can be jammed. That makes them inferior. Also, there's a bit of a time delay between, you know, if, if we're piloting something from far away, speed of light, and the human has a reaction time as well, it would be nice to eliminate that jamming possibility in the time delay by having it fully autonomous. Mm -hmm. But now you might be, so then if you do, but now you might be crossing that exact line. You might program it to just, oh yeah, the air drone, go hover over this country for a while. And whenever you find someone who is a bad guy, you know, kill them. Mm -hmm. Now the machine is making these sort of decisions. And you and some people who defend this still say, well, that's morally fine because we are the good guys and we will tell it the definition of bad guy mm -hmm. that we think is moral. But now it would be very naive to think that if ISIS buys that same drone, that they're going to use our definition of bad guy. Mm -hmm. Maybe for them, bad guy is someone wearing a U.S. Army uniform. Right. Or maybe maybe there will be some weird uh, ethnic group who decides that someone of an other ethnic group, they are the bad guys, right? Yes. The thing is, human soldiers with all our faults, right, we still have some basic wiring in yes. us. Like, no, it's not okay to kill kids yeah. and civilians. And, and Thomas Weapon has none of that. It's yeah. just gonna do whatever is programmed. It's like the perfect Adolf Eichmann on steroids. Like, they told him, Adolf Eichmann, you know, he wanted to do this and this and this to make the Holocaust more efficient. And he was like, Yawl. and off he went and did it, right? Yeah. Do we really want to make machines that are like that, like completely amoral and will take the user's definition of who is the bad guy? And do we then want to make them so cheap that all our adversaries can have them? Like, what could possibly go wrong? That's, the, that's I think, the big argument for why we want to, this year, really put the kibosh on this. And I, I think uh, you can tell there's a lot of, very active debate even going on within the U.S. military and undoubtedly 
in other militaries around the world also about whether we should have some sort of international agreement to at least require that these weapons have to be above a certain size and cost, you know, so that um, things just don't uh, totally spiral out of control. Uh, the, and finally, just for your question, but is it possible to stop it? Because some people tell me, oh, just give up, you know. But again, so so in Matthew Messelson again from Harvard, right? Who mm -hmm. the bioweapons hero? He had exactly this criticism also with bioweapons. People were like, "How can you check for sure that the Russians aren't cheating?" <laughs> and um, he he told me this, I think, really ingenious insight. He said, "You know, Max." <laughs> and it's going to be like a huge embarrassment for us yeah and it doesn't have it's we still have our nuclear weapons anyway so it doesn't really uh, make an enormous difference in in terms of deterring the u.s you know and that feeds the stigma that you kind of uh, establish like this fabric this universal stigma over the thing exactly so it's very reasonable for them to say well you know we probably get away with it but if we don't then the u.s will know we cheated and then they're going to go full tilt with their program and say look the chinese are cheaters and that's going to now we have all these weapons against us and that's bad so the stigma alone is very very powerful and, and again look what happened with bioweapons right it's been 50 years now yeah when was the last time you read about a bioterrorism attack the only deaths i really know about with bioweapons that have happened that, when we Americans managed to kill some of our own with anthrax, you know, the idiot who sent them to Tom Daschle and others yeah. in letters, right? And similarly, the, in uh, Sverdlovsk in the Soviet Union, they had some anthrax in some lab there. Maybe they were cheating or who knows, and it leaked out and killed a bunch of Russians. I'd say that's a pretty good success, right? Yeah. 50 years, just two own goals by the superpowers, and then nothing. And that's why... Whenever I ask anyone what they think about biology, they they think it's great. They associate it with with new cures, new diseases, maybe a good vaccine. This is how I want to think about AI in the future. I want and I want others to think about AI too, mm -hmm. as a source of all these great solutions to our problems, not as oh AI. Oh yeah, that's the reason I feel scared going outside these days. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of brilliant that the, the bioweapons and nuclear weapons, we've figured out, I mean, of course, they're still a huge source of danger, but we figured out some way of creating rules and social stigma over these weapons that then r creates a stability to our, whatever that game theoretic stability exactly. that occurs. Exactly. And we don't have that with AI. And you're kind of <laughs> screaming from the top of the uh, the mountain about this, that we need to find that because uh, just, just like, you know, it's very possible, you know, with Future of Life, as you've pointed out, uh, Institute uh, Awards pointed out that, uh, you know, with nuclear weapons, we could have destroyed ourselves quite a few yeah. times. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's a learning experience that uh doesn't is very costly we uh, gave you know this future life award has in in my opinion made the greatest positive contribution to humanity of any human in, in modern history mm -hmm. and maybe it sounds like hyperbole here like i'm just over the top but let me tell you the story <laughs> the one that he was on to try to force it to the surface but we didn't know that this nuclear submarine actually was a nuclear submarine with a nuclear torpedo we also didn't know that they had authorization to launch it without clearance from moscow and we also didn't know that they were running out of electricity their batteries were almost dead they were running out of oxygen sailors were fainting left and right the temperature was about 110 120 fahrenheit on board it was really hellish conditions really just like kind of doomsday mm -hmm. and at that point these giant explosions start happening from the americans dropping these the captain thought world war three had begun they decided that they were, were going to launch the nuclear torpedo 
And one of them shouted, you know, we're all going to die, but we're not going to disgrace our Navy. You know, we don't know. Uh, the next year we gave the, this Future Life Award to Stanislav Petrov. Have you heard of him? Yes. So he, he was in charge of the Soviet early warning uh, station, which was built with Soviet technology and honestly not that reliable. It said that there were five U.S. missiles coming in. Again, if they had launched at that point, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. He decided, based on just mainly gut instinct, to just not tell, not re to not escalate this. And, and uh, I'm very glad he wasn't replaced by an AI that was just automatically following orders. And then we gave the third one to Matthew Messelson. Last year, we gave this award to... Uh, killed half a billion people in, in the its final century. Smallpox, right? So you mentioned it earlier. COVID, on average, kills less than 1% of people who get it. Smallpox, about 30%. And um, they just, ultimately, Viktor Zdanov and Bill Fagey, most of my colleagues have never heard of either of them, um, one American, one Russian, they did this amazing effort not only was Zhdanov able to get the U.S. and the Soviet Union to team up against smallpox during the Cold War, but Bill Fagey came up with this ingenious strategy for making it actually go all the way to defeat the disease with, without funding for vaccinating everyone. And as a result, we haven't had any. We went from 15 million deaths the year I was born in smallpox. So what do we have in COVID now? A little bit short of 2 million, right? Yes to zero deaths of course this year and forever there have been 200 million people they estimate who would have died since then by smallpox had it not been for this so isn't science awesome <laughs> yeah, that... <laughs> when you use it for good and i, I the yeah. reason we want to celebrate these sort of people is, is to remind them of this science is so awesome when you use it for good and those uh, those awards actually uh, th the variety there paints a very interesting picture so the 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 first two are looking at it's kind of exciting to think that these these average humans in some sense that they're, they're products of you know billions of other humans that came before yeah. them evolution and some little you, you said gut you know but there's something in there that that uh stopped the annihilation of the human race <laughs> and that's a magical thing but that's like this deeply human thing. And then there's the other aspect where that's also very human, which is to build solution to the to the existential crises that we're facing, like to, to build it, to take. Our military, because first of all, he was very loyal, of course. He never even told anyone about this during his whole life. Yeah. even though you think he had some bragging rights, right? Yes. But he just was like, this is just business, just doing my job. It only came out later after his death. And and second, the reason he did the right thing was not because he was some sort of liberal or some sort of, not because he was just, oh, you know, uh, peace and love. It was partly because he had been the captain on another submarine that had a nuclear reactor meltdown. Mm-hmm. And it was his heroism that helped contain this. That's why he died of cancer later also. But he's seen many of his crew members die. And I think for him, that gave him this gut feeling that, you know, if there's a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the whole world is going to go through what I saw my dear crew members suffer through. It wasn't just an abstract thing for him. I think yeah. it was real. And second, though, not just the gut, the mind, right? He he was, for some reason, just a very level-headed personality and a very smart guy, which is exactly what we want our best fighter pilots to be also, right? I, I, I never forget Neil Armstrong when he's landing on the moon and almost running out of gas. Mm -hmm. And he, he doesn't even change, when they say 30 seconds, he doesn't even change the tone of voice, just yeah. keeps going. Arkhipov, I think, was just like that. So when the explosions start going off and his captain is screaming and we should nuke them and, and all... He's like, 
I don't think the Americans are trying to sink us. I think they're trying to send us a message. That's pretty badass. Yes. <laughs> Coolness. Because he said, yeah. if they wanted to sink us, you know, and he said, l l listen, listen, it's alternating. One loud explosion on the left, one on the right. One on the left, one on the right. He was the only one who noticed this pattern. And he, he's like, I think this is a, them trying to send us a signal that they want us to surface. Uh, they're not going to sink us. Uh, and somehow, this is how he then managed to ultimately, with his com combination of gut you know, and also just cool analytical thinking, was able to de-escalate the whole thing. And uh, yeah, so this is the, <laughs> some of the best in humanity. I guess coming back to what we talked about earlier, it's the combination of the neural network, the instinctive, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, yeah. I'm getting the tearing up here, I'm getting yeah. emotional, but he, he was just... He is one of my superheroes, com having both <laughs> the, gut, the heart, you know, and, and the mind combined. And especially in that time, uh, th there's something about the, I mean, this is a very, in America, people are used to this kind of idea of being the individual, um, of like, on your own thinking. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, under, in the Soviet Union, under communism, it's, it's actually much harder to do that. Oh, yeah. He it's, didn't even, he even got... He didn't get any accolades either when he came back for this, right? right? Uh, they just wanted to hush the whole thing up. Yeah, there's echoes of that with Chernobyl. There's all kinds of um, uh, that. That's one. That's that's a really hopeful thing that amidst big centralized powers, whether it's companies yeah. or states, there's still the power of the individual to think on their own to act. But. I think we need to think of people like this not as a panacea we can always right. count on, but rather as a wake-up call. You know, yes. so because of them, because of Arkhipov, we are alive to learn from this lesson, to learn from the fact that we shouldn't keep playing Russian roulette and almost have a nuclear war by mistake now and then, because. Relying on luck is not a good long-term strategy. If you keep playing Russian roulette over and over again, the probability of surviving just drops exponentially with time. Yeah. And if you have some probability of having an accidental nuke war every year, the probability of not having one also drops exponentially. I think we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think uh, the message is very clear. There are, once in a while, shit happens. And um, there is a lot of very concrete things we can do to uh, reduce the risk of things like that happening in the first place. On the AI front, if we could just link on that for, for yeah. a second. Uh, so you're friends with, you often talk with Elon Musk throughout history, you've uh, did a lot of interesting things together. Um, he has a, a, a set of fears about the future of artificial intelligence, AGI. Do you have a sense, you've, we've already talked about the things we should be worried about with AI. Do you have a sense of the shape of his fears in particular about AI, uh, of the which subset of what we've talked about, whether it's uh, creating, you know, it's that. Um, uh, I, have, I believe in the fundamental goodness of humanity that if we, educate people well and they find out how things really are people generally want to do good and be good uh, hence it, the value alignment as yes. opposed to, it's it's a human entities we talked about corporations there has to be institutions so that what they do is actually good for the country they're in and we should align do make sure that what countries do is actually good for you the species as a whole etc uh, coming back to Elon, yeah, my my, my uh, understanding of of how Elon sees this is really quite similar to my own, which is one of the reasons I like him so much and enjoy talking with him so much. I feel he's quite different from most people in that he thinks much more than most people about the really big picture, not just what's going to happen in the next election cycle. But in millennia, millions and billions of years from now, right? And if you, when you look in this more cosmic perspective, it's so obvious 
So we're gazing out into this universe that, as far as we can tell, is mostly dead, with, with life being a almost imperceptibly tiny perturbation, right? And and he <laughs> sees this enormous yeah. opportunity for our universe to come alive, for us yeah. to become an interplanetary species. Yeah. Mars is obviously just first stop on, on this cosmic journey. And, and precisely because he thinks more long term, it's much more clear to him than to most people that what we do with this Russian roulette thing, we keep playing with our nukes is a really poor strategy, a really reckless strategy. And also that, that that we're just building these ever more powerful AI systems that we don't understand is also just a really reckless strategy. I, I feel Elon is a very much a humanist in the sense that he wants an awesome future for humanity. <laughs> have a bad day that's what i think about it immediately makes me feel better what, what? it makes me sad that for us individual humans at least for now the ride ends too quickly that we don't get to experience the cosmic scale yeah i mean i, I think of our universe sometimes as an organism that has only begun to wake up a tiny bit uh, just like when you the the very first little glimmers of consciousness you have in the morning when yeah. you start coming around before the coffee <laughs> before the coffee even before you get out of bed before yeah. you even open your eyes you start start to wake up a little bit oh there's something here you know uh, that's very much how i think of of what we are you know those all those galaxies out there you know i think they're really beautiful but why are they beautiful they're beautiful because conscious entities are actually ex observing them and experiencing them through our telescopes. If I, you know, I define consciousness as subjective experience, whether it be colors or emotions or sounds. So beauty is an experience, meaning is an experience, purpose is an experience. If there was no conscious experience ob observing these galaxies, they wouldn't be beautiful. If if we do something dumb with advanced AI in the future here and Earth originating life goes extinct, and that was it for this, if there is nothing else with telescopes in our universe, then it's kind of game over for meaning, beauty and meaning and purpose in our whole universe. And I think that would be just such an opportunity lost, frankly. And I think... When Elon points this out, he gets very unfairly uh, maligned in the media for all the dumb media bias reasons we talked about, right? They want to print precisely the things about Elon out of context that are really clickbaity. Mm -hmm. Like, he has gotten so much flack for this uh, summoning the demon statement. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I happen to know exactly the context because i was in the front row when he gave that talk it was at mit you'll be mm -hmm. pleased to know it was the aero astro anniversary they had buzz aldrin there from the moon landing the whole house at kresge auditorium packed with mit students and he had this amazing q a it might have gone for an hour and they we talked about rockets and mars and everything at the very end this one student who was actually in my class <laughs> yeah. asked him what about ai Elon makes this one comment, and they take this out of context, print it, goes viral. Was it like with AI, we're summoning the demon, something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, that? Mm -hmm. And try to cast him as some sort of doom and gloom dude, you know. Yeah. You know Elon. That's, yes. <laughs> he's not the doom and gloom dude. No. He, he is such a positive visionary. And the whole reason he warns about this is because he realizes more than most what the opportunity cost is of screwing up. That there is so much awesomeness in the future that we can, we can and our descendants can enjoy if we don't screw up, right? I, I get so pissed off when people try to cast him as some sort of technophobic Luddite. And, and at this point, it's kind of ludicrous when when I hear people say that people who worry about artificial general intelligence are Luddites, because, of course, if you look more closely, you have some of the most art outspoken people making warnings are people like Professor Stuart Russell from Berkeley, who's written the best-selling AI textbook, you know, so claiming that he's a Luddite who doesn't understand AI is, is the joke is really on the 
the people who said it, but but I think more broadly, this message is really not sunk in at all. What it is that people worry about, they think that Elon and Stuart Russell and others are worried about the dancing robots uh, picking up an AR-15 and going on a rampage, right? They think they're worried about robots turning evil. They're not. I'm not. You know, the, the risk is not malice. It's, it's competence. The risk is just that we build some systems that are incredibly competent, which means they're always going to get their goals accomplished, even if they clash with our goals. Mm -hmm. That's the risk. Why did we humans, you know, drive the West African black rhino extinct? Is it because we're malicious, evil rhinoceros haters? No, it's just because our goals didn't align with the goals of those rhinos and tough luck for the rhinos, you know. So when I'm when we, the point is just we don't want to put ourselves in the position of those rhinos creating these something more powerful than us if we haven't first figured out how to align the goals. And I am optimistic. I think we could do it if we worked really hard on it because I spent a lot of time around intelligent entities that were more intelligent than me. My mom and my... You know, again, thinking of the cosmic scale, Elon's talked about this, uh, but others are, have as well throughout history of figuring out how the exact mechanism of how to achieve that kind of alignment. So one of them is having a symbiosis with AI, mm -hmm. which is like coming up with clever ways where we're like stuck together in this weird uh, relationship, whether it's biological or in some kind of other. Talking to these intelligible, self-doubting AIs, maybe like Stuart Russell thinks about it, like these, these we're we're self-doubting and, and full of uncertainty, and then have our AI systems that are full of uncertainty. We communicate back and forth, and in that way, achieve symbiosis. I honestly don't know. I would say that because we don't know for sure what, if any of our, which of any of our ideas will work, but we do know that if we don't. I'm pretty convinced that if we don't get any of these things to work and just barge ahead, then our species is, you know, probably going to go extinct this century. I think it this century. You think like you think we're facing this crisis is a 21st century crisis. Like oh, th yeah. this century will be remembered <laughs> we'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> by, on a hard drive, <laughs> on a hard drive somewhere, or or maybe by future generations as like. Uh, like there will be future future of life institute awards for people that have done something about AI. It could also end even worse, where there is we're not superseded by leaving any AI behind either. We we just totally wipe out, you know, like on Easter Island. Our century is long. No, it's, it, yeah. there are still seventy nine years left of it. Right? Think about how far we've come just in the last thirty years. So. We can talk more about what might go wrong, but you asked me this really good question about what's the best strategy. Is it Neuralink or mm -hmm. Russell's approach or, or, or whatever? I think, um, you know, when we, when we did the Manhattan Project, we didn't know if any of our four ideas for enriching uranium and getting out the uranium-235 were going to work. But we felt this was really important to get it before Hitler did. So you know what we did? We tried all four of them. Here, I think it's an, it's analogous where there's a, the greatest threat that's ever faced our species, and of course, U.S. national security by implication. We don't know, if, we don't have any method that's guaranteed to work, but we have a lot of ideas. So we should invest pretty heavily in pursuing all of them with an open mind and, and the hope that one of them at least works. <laughs> But it takes a long time also to, to solve these very, very difficult problems. It's going to actually be the, it's the most difficult problem we were ever trying to solve as a species. So we have to start now. Uh, so we don't have rather than, you know, begin thinking about it the night before some people who had too much Red Bull switch it on. And, and we, we have to coming back to your question, we, we have to pursue all of these different avenues and see if you're my investment advisor, 
and I was trying to invest in the future. Uh, how do you think the human species is most likely to destroy itself in uh, this century? Uh, yeah, in, uh, so if, if, if the crises, many of the crises we're facing are really before us within the next hundred years. Starting with the biggest existential crisis. So, as your investment advisor, how are you planning to make money on us going destroying ourselves? I have to ask. I don't know. It's uh, it might be the Russian origins. It's, <laughs> uh, somehow is in, involved at the micro level of detailed strategies. Of course, this is these are unsolved problems. F for AI alignment, we can break it into three sub problems that are all unsolved. I think with you know you want first to make machines understand our goals, then adopt our goals, and then retain our goals. So yeah. to hit on all three real quickly. The problem when Andreas Lubitz told his autopilot to fly into the Alps was that the computer didn't even understand anything about his goals, right? It was too dumb. It could have understood, actually, but we you would have had to put some effort in as a system designer to don't fly into mountains. So that's the first challenge. How do you how do you program into computers human values, human goals? We can start rather than than saying, oh, it's so hard, we should start with the simple stuff, as I said. Or self driving cars, airplanes, just put in all the goals that we all agree on already. And then have a habit of whenever machines get smarter, so they can understand one level higher goals you know put them into uh, the second challenge is uh getting them to adopt the goals it's easy for situations like that where you just program it in but when you have self-learning systems like children you know mm -hmm. <laughs> any parent knows that um <laughs> kind of too it's late uh, but we have this window with machines, the challenge is they might, the intelligence might grow so fast that that window is pretty right. short. So that's a that's a research problem. The third one is how do you make sure they keep the goals if they keep learning more and getting smarter? Many sci-fi movies are about how you have something which initially was aligned, but then things kind of go off keel. And you know, my kids were very very excited about their Legos when they were little. Mm -hmm. Now they're just gathering dust in the basement. You know, if we put, if we create machines that are really on board with the goal of taking care of humanity, we don't want them to get as bored with us and and as my kids got with Legos. So this is another research challenge. How can you make some sort of recursively self improving system retain certain basic goals? That said, a lot of adult people still play with Legos. So maybe we succeeded with the Legos. Maybe. I, I, I like your optimism. <laughs> but so all, not all AI systems have to maintain the goals, right? Some just some fraction. Yeah. So there so there is a there's a lot of um talented AI researchers now who have heard of this and want to work on it. Not so much funding for it yet. Uh of the billions that go into building AI more powerful it's only a minuscule fraction so far going into the safety research. My attitude is generally we should not try to slow down the technology, but we should greatly accelerate the investment in this sort of safety research. Um, and also make sure it's been, it's, this was very embarrassing last year, but you know, the NSF decided to give out um, six of these big institutes. We got one of them for AI and science, you asked me about. Mm -hmm. Another one was supposed to be for AI safety research. And they gave it people studying oceans and climate and stuff mm -hmm. like yeah so i'm all for studying oceans and climates but we need to actually have some money that actually goes into ai safety oh, research safety. also and doesn't just get grabbed by whatever um, that's a fantastic investment and then at the higher level you ask this question okay what can we do you know what are the biggest risks i think i th think we cannot just consider this to be only a technical problem like, again because if, if you solve only the technical problem can i play with your robot yes please <laughs> if we can get our machines you know to just blindly obey the orders we give them 
so we can always trust that it will do what we want that might be great for the owner of the robot but it might not be so great for the rest of humanity if if that person is that least favorite world leader or whatever you yeah. imagine right so we have to also take look at the apply alignment not just to machines but to all the other powerful structures that's right. why it's so important to strengthen our democracy again as i said to have institutions that make sure that the playing field is not rigged so that corporations are given the right incentives to do the things that both make profit and are good for people uh, to make sure that countries have incentives to do things that are both good for their people and don't screw up the rest of the world and this is not just something for ai nerds you know to geek out on this is the interesting challenge for political scientists economists and, and so many other thinkers so one of the magical things that um, perhaps makes hum this earth quite unique is that it's home to conscious beings so you mentioned consciousness uh, perhaps as a small aside because we didn't really get specific to what how we might do the alignment like you said it's just a really important research problem but yeah do you think engineering consciousness into ai systems is is a, a possibility is something that we might one day do or is there something mm -hmm. fundamental to consciousness that is uh is there something about consciousness that is fundamental to humans and humans only i think it's possible I think um, both consciousness and intelligence are information processing, certain types of information processing, and that fundamentally it doesn't matter whether the information is processed by carbon atoms in neurons and brains or by silicon atoms and, and, and so on in our technology. Some people disagree. This is what I think as a physicist that I... I and uh, that I, consciousness is the same kind of you said consciousness is information processing so meaning you know uh, I, I think you had a quote of something like it's information uh knowing itself that kind of thing i think consciousness it, is, yeah is is the way information feels when it's being processed when it's being complex that, yeah, ways we don't right. know exactly what those complex ways are it's clear that most of the information processing in our brains does not create an experience. We're not even aware of it, right? Like, for example, um, you're not aware of your heartbeat regulation right now, even though it's clearly being done by your body, right? Pain, or it's okay because it's not feeling pain. Right now we treat this as sort of just metaphysics, uh, but, um, it would be very useful in emergency rooms to know if a patient has locked in syndrome and is conscious or if they are actually just out. And in the future, if you build a very, very intelligent helper robot to take care of you, you know, I think you'd like to know if you should feel guilty about shutting it down or if, or if it's just like a zombie going through the motions like a fancy tape recorder, right? And, and it, once we can make progress on the science of consciousness and figure out what is conscious and what isn't, then um, we, assuming we want to create positive experiences and not suffering, we'll probably choose to build some. I think everybody gets pretty deeply lonely in this world. Yeah. And uh, so there's a place, I think, for everybody to have a connection with conscious beings, whether they're human or otherwise. But I know for sure that I would, if I had a robot, if I was going to develop any kind of personal emotional connection with it, I would be very creeped out if I knew it in an intellectual level that the whole thing was just a fraud. You know, today you can buy a little talking doll for a, for a kid, which will say things, and the little child will often think that this is actually conscious, yes. and even real secrets to it that then go on the internet and <laughs> with all sorts of creepy repercussions. Uh, you know, I would not want to be just hacked and tricked like this. If I was going to be 
developing real emotional connections with with the robot, I would want to know that this is actually real. It's acting conscious, acting happy because it actually feels it. And I, I think this is not sci-fi. I, I think it's possible to measure, to come up with tools. And make, after we understand the science of consciousness, yeah. you're saying it's, we'll be able to come up with tools that can yeah. measure consciousness and definitively say, like, this thing is experiencing the things it says it's experiencing. Yeah. Kind of by definition, if it is a physical phenomena, information processing, that, and we know that some information processing is conscious and some isn't, well, then there is something there to be discovered with the methods of science. Giulio Tononi has stuck his neck out the farthest and written down some equations for a theory. Maybe that's right, maybe it's wrong, we certainly don't know. Um, but I, I applaud that kind of efforts to, to sort of take this, say this, say this is not just something that philosophers can have beer and muse about, but something we can measure and, we can study. And coming, bringing that back to us, I, I think what we would probably choose to do, as I said, is if we cannot figure this out, choose to make, to be quite mindful about what sort of consciousness, if any, we put in, in different machines that we have. We, um, and certainly, not, we, we wouldn't want to make, we should not be making a bunch of machines that suffer without us even knowing it, right? And if if at any point someone decides to upload themselves, like Ray Kurzweil wants to do, I don't know if you've had him on your show. We agree, but then COVID happens, okay. so we're waiting it out a little bit. You know, suppose he uploads himself into this Robo Ray, yeah. and it talks like him, and acts like him, and laughs like him, and before he powers off his biological body, he would probably be pretty disturbed if he realized that there's no one home. This robot is not having any subjective experience, right? If we repl if humanity gets replaced by by uh, ro by machine descendants, which do all these cool things and build spaceships and go to intergalactic rock concerts, and it turned out turns out that they are all unconscious, uh, just going through the motions. Wouldn't that be like the ultimate uh, robot zombie apocalypse, right? Just a play for empty benches? Yeah, I have a sense that there's some kind of, once we understand consciousness better, we'll understand that there's some kind of continuum and it would be a greater appreciation. And we'll probably understand, just like you said, it, it'd be unfortunate if it's a trick. We'll probably definitively understand that love is indeed a trick that we'll play on each other, uh, that we humans are, we convince ourselves we're conscious, but we're really, um, you know, us and trees and dolphins are all the same kind of conscious. Can I try to cheer you up a little bit with a philosophical thought here about the yes. love part? Yes, yes, let's do it. <laughs> you know, you might say, okay, yeah, love is just a collaboration enabler, <laughs> uh, and then you'll, and then maybe you can go and get depressed about that. But I, I think that would be the wrong conclusion, actually. You know, like I know that the only reason I enjoy food is because my genes hacked me and they don't want me to starve to death. Not because they care about me consciously enjoying succulent delights of mm -hmm. pistachio ice cream, but they just, they just want me to make copies of them. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, so in a sense, the whole, the whole enjoyment of food is also a scam yeah. like this. But does that mean I shouldn't, take pleasure in this pistachio ice cream. I love pistachio ice cream and I can tell you I have I have I know this is an experimental fact. I enjoy pistachio ice cream every bit as much even though I scientifically know exactly why I, what well, kind of scam this was. Your genes really appreciate that you like the pistachio ice cream. <laughs> well, but I my mind appreciates it too, yes. you know, and I have a conscious experience right now. Ultimately, all of my brain is also just something the genes built to copy themselves. But so what? You know, I'm grateful that, yeah, thanks, genes, for doing this. But, you know, now it's my brain that's in charge here. And I'm going to enjoy my conscious experience. Thank you very much. And not just the pistachio ice cream, but also the love I, I feel for my amazing wife and all the other delights of, of being conscious. I don't. Actually, Richard Feynman, I think, said this so well. He, he is also the guy who you know, really got me into physics. Uh, some art friend said that, oh, science kind of just is the party pooper. 
it kind of ruins the fun, right? It, when, when like you have a beautiful flower, says the artist, and then the scientist is going to deconstruct that into just a blob of quarks and electrons. And, and, and Feynman just pushed back on that in such a beautiful way, which I think also can be used to push back and make you appreciate not feel guilty about falling in love. Mm -hmm. So so here's what Feynman basically said. He said to his friend, you know, yeah, I can also, as a scientist, see that this is a beautiful flower. Thank you very much. Maybe I'm, I can't draw as good a painting as you because I'm not as talented an artist. But yeah, I can really see the beauty in it. And it just, it also looks beautiful to me. But in addition to that, Feynman said, as a scientist, I see even more beauty that the artist did not see, right? Suppose this is the a flower on a on a blossoming apple tree. You could say this tree has more beauty in it than just the, fr the colors and the fragrance. This tree is made of air, Feynman wrote. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite Feynman quotes ever. And it, it took the carbon out of the air and bound it in using the flaming heat of the sun, you know, to yeah. turn the air into a tree. And when you burn logs in your fireplace, <laughs> It's really beautiful to think that this is being reversed. Now the tree is going, the wood is going back into air and in this flaming, beautiful dance of the fire that the artist can see is the flaming light of the sun mm -hmm. that was bound in to turn the air into tree. And then the ashes is, is the little residue that didn't come from the air that the tree sucked out of the ground. You know, Feynman said, these are beautiful things and science just adds, it doesn't subtract. And I, I feel exactly that way about love and about pistachio ice cream also. <laughs> I can understand that it and even there is even more nuance to the whole thing, yeah. right? At this very visceral level, you can fall in love just as much as someone who knows nothing about neuroscience. But you can also appreciate this even greater beauty uh, in it. Just like, isn't it remarkable that it came about from from this completely lifeless universe, just a bunch of a hot blob of plasma expanding. And then over the eons, you know, gradually, first the strong nuclear force decided to combine quarks together into nuclei, and then the electric force bound in electrons and made atoms, and then they clustered from gravity, and you got planets and stars and this and that, and then natural selection came along and, and the genes had their little thing and you started getting what went from seeming like a completely pointless universe that was just trying to increase entropy and approach heat death into something that looked more goal-oriented. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of beautiful? And then this goal-orientedness through evolution got ever more sophisticated where... Yeah. And elephants... And humans and, and, and ice love. Cream. <laughs> I, I just find that yeah. really beautiful, and I, I to me that just adds to the enjoyment of of love. It doesn't subtract anything. Do you feel a little more? <laughs> I feel now? way better. That was that was incredible. So the this self play of quarks, taking back to the beginning of our conversation a little bit. You've there's so many exciting possibilities about artificial intelligence understanding the basic laws of physics. Do you think AI will help us unlock? There's been a, quite a bit of excitement throughout the history of physics of coming up with m more and more general, simple laws that explain the nature of our reality. And then the ultimate of that would be a, a theory of everything that combines everything together. Do you think it's possible that well, one, we humans, but perhaps AI systems will figure out a theory of physics that unifies all the laws of physics. Yeah, I think it's absolutely absolutely possible. I think it's it's very clear that we're going to see a great boost to science. We're already seeing a boost, actually, from from machine learning helping science. Alpha fold was an example. You know, the decades old protein folding problem. So and and gradually, yeah. Unless we go extinct by doing something dumb like we discussed, <laughs> I think it it's um, very likely that our understanding of physics will become so good that uh, our technology will no longer be limited by human intelligence, but instead be limited by the laws of physics. 
so our tech today is limited by what we've been able to invent, right? Uh, I think as I, AI progresses, it'll just be limited by the speed of light and other physical limits, which will mean it's going to be just dramatically beyond you know where we are now. Do you think it's a fundamentally mathematical pursuit of trying to understand like the laws of this that govern the, our universe from a mathematical perspective? So almost like if it's AI, it's exploring the space of like theorems and those, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Or is there some other uh, is 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 there some other more computational ideas? more sort of empirical ideas. They're both, I would say. It's really interesting to look out at the landscape of everything we call science today. So here you come out with this big new hammer. It says machine learning on it and ask, you know, where are there some nails that you can help with here that you can hammer? Ultimately, if machine learning gets to the point that it can do everything better than us, is we'll be able to help across the whole space of, of, of science. But maybe we can anchor it by starting a little. Very effectively, even at MIT, you right, to find planets around other stars, to detect exciting new signatures of new particle physics in the sky, and to detect them. So um, we had to do all our computations by hand, right? People would have these giant books with tables of logarithms, and oh my <laughs> God, I just, it just pain, pains me to even think how, how long time it would have taken to do simple stuff. Then we started to get little calculators and computers that could do some basic math for us. Now, what we're starting to see is kind of a shift from GoFi computational physics to uh, neural network, computational physics. What I mean by that is most computational physics would be done by humans programming in right. the intelligence of how to do the computation into the mm -hmm. computer. Just as when Gary... Because you're going at the subatomic scale, down to the subatomic scale, mm -hmm. and you try to solve this. But it's just so computationally expensive that we still haven't been able to calculate things as accurately as we measure them in many cases. And now machine learning is really revolutionizing this. So my colleague Fiola Shanahan at MIT, for example, she's been using this really cool machine learning technique called normalizing flows, where she's realized she can actually speed up the calculation dramatically by having the AI learn how to do things faster. Hmm. Another area like this where we, where we suck up an enormous amount of supercomputer time to do physics is black hole collisions. So now that we've done the sexy stuff of detecting a bunch of this, mm -hmm. with LIGO and other experiments, we want to be able to per know what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very simple conceptual problem. It's the two-body problem. <laughs> Newton solved it <laughs> for classical gravity hundreds yeah. of years ago, but the two-body problem is still not fully solved. For black holes. Black hole for, yes, in Einstein's gravity, because they won't just orbit each other forever anymore, two things. They give off gravitational waves, mm -hmm. and eventually they crash into each other. And the game, what you want to do is you want to figure out, okay, what kind of wave comes out? as a function of, of the masses of the two black holes, as a function of how they're spinning relative to each other, etc. And that is so hard. It can take months of supercomputer time and massive numbers of cores to do it, you know. Wouldn't it be great if you can use machine learning to, to greatly speed that up, right? Um, now you, you can use the expensive old GoFi calculation as the truth, and then see if machine learning can figure out a smarter, faster way of getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. uh, yet another area like of computational physics. The, the, these are probably the big three that suck up the most computer time. Lattice QCD, uh, black hole collisions, and cosmological simulations, mm -hmm. where you take not a subatomic th thing and try to figure out the mass of the proton, but you take something with 
it's enormous and try to look at how all the galaxies get formed in there oh wow. yeah there again there are a lot of very cool ideas right now about how you can use machine learning to do this sort of better stuff better the difference between this and the big data is you kind of make the data yourself right so you, and then finally we're looking over the physics landscape and seeing what can we hammer with machine learning <laughs> yes. right so we talked about experimental data big data discovering cool like so things like discovering equations mm -hmm. having deep fundamental insights this comes this is something closest to what i've been doing in my how do you search through some giant space to find the needle in the haystack mm -hmm. it's easier in cases where there's a clear measure of of good like you're not just right or wrong but this is better and this is worse you can maybe get some hints as to which direction to go in that's why we talked about neural networks work so well mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's such a human thing of that moment of genius of figuring out the intuition of of good, essentially. I mean, we thought that that or is was, it? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not right. We thought that about chess, right? That exactly uh, that the, the ability to see like ten, fifteen, sometimes twenty steps ahead was not a calculation that humans were performing. It was some kind of weird intuition about different patterns about board positions about the relative positions exactly. of the, somehow st stitching stuff together and a lot of it is just like intuition but then you you have like alpha i guess zero be the first one that did uh uh the self-play it, it just came up with this it's, it was able to learn through self-play mechanism this kind of intuition exactly but just like you said it's so fascinating to think well they're in the space of totally new ideas can that be done in, yeah. in developing theorems we know it can be done by neural networks because we did it with the neural networks in the cranium of right. the great mathematicians of our uh, of humanity right and and i'm so glad you brought up alpha zero because that's the counter example it turned out we were flattering ourselves when we said intuition is something different it's only humans can do it it's not information processing <laughs> if you if it used to be that way that you know, again it's very it's really instructive i think to compare the chess computer deep blue that beat kasparov with alpha zero that beat lisa doll at at go because for deep blue there was no intuition there was some pro humans had programmed in some intuition after humans had played a lot of games they told the computer you know Count the pawn as one point, the uh, bishop is three points, uh, rook is five points, and so on. You add it all up, and then you add some extra points for past pawns, and subtract if the opponent has it, and and blah, 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 blah. And then what, uh, what Deep Blue did was just search. Just very brute force, mm -hmm. tried many, many moves ahead, all these combinations, and a prune tree search, and it could think much faster than Kasparov, and it won, right? Mm-hmm. And that, I think, inflated our egos in a way it shouldn't have, because people started to say, yeah, yeah, it's just brute force search, but it has no intuition. Yeah. Alpha Zero really <laughs> popped our bubble there, yeah. because what Alpha Zero does, yes, it does also do some of that tree search, but it also has this intuition module, which in geek speak is called a value function. Mm -hmm. where it just looks at the board and comes up with a number for how good is that position. The difference was no human told it how good the position is. It just learned it. And mu zero is the is, uh, coolest or scariest of all, depending on your mood, uh, because it the same basic AI system will learn what the good board position is, regardless of whether it's chess or go or shogi or Brit Pac-Man or Lady Pac. What are some good directions to go if you're trying to prove something? If you... I, I often 
one of the more most fun things in my science career is when I've been able to prove some theorem about something. And it's very heavily intuition guided, of course. I don't sit and try all random strings. I'm, I have a hunch that, you know, this reminds me a little bit of about this other proof mm -hmm. I've seen for this thing. So maybe I first, what if I try this? Mm -hmm. Nah, that didn't work out. But like, but this reminds me actually, the way this failed reminds me of that. And yeah. so so combining the intuition that with all these brute force cap capabilities, uh, I think I think it's going to be able to help physics too. Do you think the, there will be a day when an AI system being the primary contributor, let's say 90% plus wins the Nobel Prize in physics? Obviously, they'll give it to the humans because we humans don't like to give prizes to machines. <laughs> it'll give it'll give it to the humans behind the system. You could argue that AI has already been involved in some Nobel prizes, probably maybe something with black holes and stuff like that. But. Yeah, we don't like giving uh, prizes to other life forms. If <laughs> if someone wins a horse racing contest, they, they don't give the prize to horse either. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, but do you think? That's we might be able to see something like that in our lifetimes when AI. So, like th the first system, I would say that makes us think about a Nobel Prize seriously is like Alpha Fold, is making us think about uh, in medicine physiology a Nobel Prize, perhaps discoveries that are a direct result of something that's discovered by Alpha Fold. Do you think in physics we might be able to see that in our lifetimes? I think what's probably going to happen is more of a blurring of, of the distinctions. Uh, so today, if somebody uses a computer to do a computation that gives them the normal prize, nobody's going to dream of giving the prize to the computer. They're going to be like, that was just a tool. I, I think uh, for these things also, people are just going to, for a long time, view the computer as a tool. But what's going to ha change is that the, is the ubiquitous the ubiquity of, of machine learning. I, I think at some point in my lifetime, finding a human physicist who knows nothing about machine learning is going to be about almost as hard as it is today finding a human physicist who doesn't, says, oh, I don't know anything about computers right. or I don't use math. Right. It would just be a ridiculous concept. But, see, but the thing is, there is a magic moment, though, like with Alpha Zero, when the system surprises us in a way mm -hmm. where the best people in the world truly learn something from the system in yeah. a way where you feel like it's another entity. Yeah. Like the, the way people, the way Magnus Carlsen, the way certain people are looking at the work of Alpha Zero, it's like uh, it, it truly is no longer a tool in the in the sense that it doesn't feel like a tool it feels like some other entity so th yeah. there is a magic difference like oh, where yeah. where you're like uh you know if an ai system is able to come up with an insight that surprises everybody yeah. in, in a some uh in, in some like major way that's a phase shift in our understanding of some particular science or some, some particular aspect of physics I feel like that is no longer a tool. And, th and then you can start to say uh, that like it perhaps deserves the prize. So for sure, the more important, the more fundamental transformation of the 21st century science is exactly what you're saying, which is probably everybody will be doing machine learning. It's to some degree. Like if you want to be su successful, at uh, unlocking the mysteries of science, you should be doing machine learning. But it's just exciting to think about like whether there will be one that comes along that's super surprising, and uh, they'll make us question like who the real inventors are in this world. Yeah, yeah. I think the question of isn't if it's going to happen, but when, and and but it's important. In my mind, the time when that happens is also. Uh, more or less the same time when we get artificial general intelligence. Yes. And then we have a lot bigger things to worry about than <laughs> whether we should get the Nobel Prize or not, right? And yeah. Because when you have machines that can outperform our best scientists at science, 
they can probably outperform us at a lot of other stuff as well, which can at a minimum, you know, make them incredibly powerful agents in, in the world, you know. And I, I think the, it's a mistake to think we only have to start worrying about loss of control when machines get to AGI across the board, when they can do everything, all our jobs. Uh, long before that, they'll be hugely influential. We talked at length about how the, the hacking of our minds with um, <laughs> algorithms trying to get us glued to our screens, right, has already had a big impact on, on society. That was an incredibly dumb algorithm in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The supervised machine learning, yet it had, had huge impact. So so um, I just want, don't want us to be lulled into a false sense of security and think there won't be any societal impact yeah. until things reach human level, because it's happening already. And, and it's I was just thinking the other week, you know, when I see some scaremonger going, oh, the robots are coming, the, the implication is always that they're coming to kill us. Yeah. And maybe you should have worried about that if you were in Nagorno-Karabakh during the recent war there. But more seriously, the robots are coming right now, but they're mainly not coming to kill us. They're coming to hack us. Hmm. They're, they're coming to hack our minds into buying things that we, maybe we didn't need to vote. <laughs> house persuade us to feed them and yeah. do all these things and what do they ever do but for us <laughs> yeah <laughs> other than well, being cute and, and making us feel good right so if puppies can hack us maybe we shouldn't be so surprised if if pretty dumb machine learning algorithms can hack us too not to speak of cats which is another Ooh. level and <laughs> and i think we should to counter your previous point about there, let us not think about evil creatures in this world. We can all agree that cats are as close to objective evil as we can get. But that's just me saying that. Okay, so uh, you have you seen the <laughs> the cartoon? I think it's maybe the Onion, um, where this incredibly cute kitten and it just says um, with underneath something about thinks about murder all day. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. That's that's accurate. Uh, you've mentioned offline that there might be a link between post-biological AGI and SETI. So last time we talked, um, you've, you've talked about this intuition that we humans might be quite unique in our galactic neighborhood, perhaps our galaxy, perhaps the entirety of the observable universe. We might be the only intelligence civilization here, which is, um, and you argue pretty well for that thought. Um, so I have a, a few little questions around this. One, the scientific question, in which way would you be, if you were wrong in that intuition, in which way do you think you would be surprised? Like, why were you wrong? You We find out that you ended up being wrong. Like, in which dimension? So, like, is it because we can't see them? Is it because the nature of their intelligence or the nature of their life is totally different than we can possibly imagine? Is it uh, because the... I mean, something about the great filters and surviving them. When you're going from simple bacteria-like things to space, space colonizing civilizations, they spend only a very, very tiny fraction of their of their, of their life being where we are. Uh, that I could be wrong about. The other one I could be wrong about is a, a quite different statement that I think that actually I'm guessing that we are the only civilization in our observable universe from which light has reached us so far that, that's actually gotten far enough to invent telescopes. So let's talk about maybe uh, both of them in turn because yes. they really are different. The first one, if, if, if you look at 
the n equals one <laughs> the data point we have on this planet yeah right so we spent um four and a half billion years futzing around on this planet with life right we got and most of it was pretty lame stuff from an intelligence perspective you know it's bacteria and then the dinosaurs spent then but things gradually accelerated right then the dinosaurs spent over 100 million years stomping around here without even inventing smartphones and um and then very recently you know it's only we've only spent 400 years going from newton to us right yeah in terms of technology and we've look what we've done even you know when i was a little kid there was no internet even <laughs> around with the ham radio and things but they just never really take it to the next level for reasons i don't have I haven't understood and i'm humble and open to that but i would bet at least 10 to 1 that the, our situation is more typical because the whole thing with moore's law and accelerating technology it's pretty obvious why it's happening mm -hmm. it, everything that grows exponentially we call it an explosion whether it's a population explosion or a nuclear explosion it's always caused by the same thing it's that the next step triggers a step after that. Mm -hmm. So I, we tomorrow's technology, today's technology enables tomorrow's technology, and that enables the next level. And as it because the technology is always better, of course, the steps can come faster and faster. Uh, on, on the other question that I might be wrong about, that's the much more controversial one, I think. Um, but, but before we close out on this thing about. If, if the first one, if it's true that most civilizations spend only a very short amount of their total time in the stage, say, between um, inventing um, telescopes or sure. elec mastering electricity and leaving their, and doing space travel, yeah. uh, if that's actually generally true, but then that should apply also elsewhere out there so we, we, we should be very very we should be very very surprised if we at find some random civilization and we happen to catch them exactly in that very very short stage mm -hmm. it's much more likely that we find a planet full of bacteria yes or uh, that we find some civilization that's already post-biological and has done some really cool galactic construction projects in, in their in their galaxy would we be able to recognize them do you think is it, is it possible that we just can't i mean this post biological world I, could it be just existing in some other dimension it could it could be just all a virtual reality game for them or something i don't know that that it changes completely where we won't be able to detect we have to be honestly very humble about this yeah. I, I think that i said i think i said earlier the number one principle of being a scientist is you have to be humble <laughs> and willing to acknowledge that everything we think guess might be totally wrong uh, of course you could imagine some civilization where they all decide to become buddhists and very inward looking and just move into their little virtual reality and not disturb the the flora and fauna around them and we might not notice them uh, but this is a numbers game right if you have millions of civilizations out there or billions of them all it takes is one with a more ambitious mentality right. that decides hey we are going to go out and settle a bunch of other solar systems and maybe galaxies and then it doesn't matter if they're a bunch of quiet buddhists we're still going to notice yeah. that expansionist one right yeah. and it, it seems like a, quite the stretch to, to assume that now, we know even in our own galaxy that there are probably a billion or more planets that are pretty Earth-like. And many of them were formed over a billion years before ours, so had a big head start. So if you actually assume also that life happens kind of automatically on an Earth-like planet, I think it's it's pretty t quite the stretch to then go and say, okay, so we are there billions of another billion civilizations out there that also have our level of tech, and they all decided to become Buddhists, and not yeah. a single one decided to go like go Hitler on the galaxy and say we need yeah. to go on and colonize, or and or not, and not a single one decided for more benevolent reasons to go out and get more resources. That that seems seems like a bit of a stretch, frankly, and, and this leads into the 
the second thing you challenged me to be that I might be wrong about how rare or common is life, you know. So Francis Drake, when he wrote down the Drake equation, multiplied together a huge number of factors and mm -hmm. said, we don't know any of them. <laughs> so we know even less about what you get when you multiply together the whole product. Yeah. Uh, since then, a lot of those factors have become much better known. Mm -hmm. One of his big uncertainties was how common is it that a solar system even has a planet? Right. Well, now we know it very common. Earth-like planets, we know we have better. There are a dime a dozen. There are yeah. many, many of them, even in our galaxy. At the same time, you know, we have, thanks to, I, I'm a big supporter of the SETI project and its cousins, uh, and I think we should keep doing this. And we've learned a lot. We've, we, we've learned that so far, all we have is still unconvincing hints, nothing more, right? And, and there are certainly many scenarios where it would be dead obvious if there were a hundred million other human-like civilizations in our galaxy, it would not be that hard to notice some of them with today's mm -hmm. technology, and we haven't, right? So, so what we can, what we can say. In fact, in many nearby solar systems, where we we cannot rule out, of course, that there is something like Earth sitting in a galaxy. Five billion light years away, mm -hmm. um, but we've ruled out a lot, and that's already kind of shocking, given that there are all these planets there. You know, so yeah. like, where are they? Where are they all? That's the that's the classic Fermi paradox. Yeah, and and um, so so my argument, which might be really wrong, is very simple. Really, it just goes like this: Okay, we have no clue about this. It could be the, the the probability of getting life on a random planet. It could be ten to the minus one a priori, or ten to the minus five, ten, or ten to the minus twenty, ten to the minus thirty, ten to the minus forty. Basically, every order of magnitude is like this. A priori, before we looked with telescopes, you know, it could be ten to ten meters, ten to twenty, ten to thirty, ten to forty, ten to fifty, ten to blah blah. blah. Equally likely anywhere here. Yeah. Uh, and now we've ruled out like this chunk. Yeah. And, and, so and most of and, it is outside. And here is the edge of our observable universe. Yes. Already. Yep. So this is the Lex Free Podcast.